Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today I am joined by author Jennifer Thorne to talk about her latest novel, Diavola, and the horror that comes with vacationing. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Did I pronounce that right, too? It is Diavola, You did. Right? That, was, okay. that, was, that was brilliant. Um, yeah. And I mean, I'm like not an, an expert in Italian. If anybody who's read this book will know I'm a big fan of Duolingo, so... That's my Duolingo level of Italian, which is not that great, but gets me by. Yeah. My husband and I went to Paris a few months ago for our anniversary, and I was on Duolingo, like, trying to learn French, and I don't feel like it helped me at all. I think, like, the the sentences they give you, and French is a difficult language. Well, and it, I mean, the sentences are niche. Like, yeah. Like, I, and it's funny, you get these like kind of eerie things on there. Like my aunt was in a terrible train accident and you're like, oh God, I hope I never have to say that in French or any language, but. Yeah. I can't wait to try that on my waiter, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the useful French. Although I did find that like in school too. Yeah. We would study like 19th century French literature so I could describe, you know, the particular petticoat in French that like a character wore. But I didn't know what anything was on a menu. I still don't. I have to. I And I, I've finally gotten over myself enough when I'm traveling to be like, I don't know what this means. Like, lay it yeah. out for me. Draw me a picture. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. I, that, I remember that in high school, too. Like, our, our textbooks had just sentences. I'm like, and when I am in Germany, do you think I'm going to ask someone how many times they feed their cat? <laughs> I don't know. That could be useful if you're like they, house. That's, that's true. I guess. It's a very specific circumstance. But... <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to tell our listeners a little yeah. bit about Diavola? So Diavola is about um, the Pace family, a kind of upper middle class American family that um, with adult kids and grandkids that every year has a big family vacation to some lovely, lovely venue. Um, and this year they've gone and uh, to Tuscany and they've gotten a lovely Airbnb villa outside of this remote village called Monteperso. And um, they picked the wrong villa, basically. It's really nice. It's got a pool. It's got views everywhere. And it's also just super haunted. And um, it probably wouldn't have been a great vacation anyway, because they just don't get along that well. In particular, our protagonist, Anna, is kind of the scapegoat for the family for for really no good reason, except that they, they just... They just don't completely get her. And then they kind of pick on her about that. And they, they kind of try to passive aggressively hack away at the aspects of her personality that they don't approve of or they don't understand. But she's a pretty stoic person. She, she's got a really strong sense of herself. So she she weathers these vacations every year. Um, and, you know, it's it's worth it to, to go to a lovely place and, and get to travel and 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 actually actually kind of check that box of I am still connected with my family. I'm doing the right thing. I'm a good person. Um, but this year's different. Uh, there's a there's a there's a lot of ghosts in this place, and one of them is extremely malevolent and parasitic. And that's what Diavola is about. <laughs> my God, I loved this. I'm a big sucker for dysfunctional families in any genre, but. I mean, the horror of it hairs so well, but it was so frustrating as a reader to read this from Anna's perspective and just see this very realistic dynamics between the family with like people enabling this type of behavior and yeah, the way that they just pick on her and turn things around on her and just always make things her fault. You're just like, ah. The expectation, like, first of all, that set up that she should translate everything for them that she's in some way you know in tight that they're entitled to her knowledge set because they've paid for this vacation when her italian's not really that good and she knows it isn't that good she's like i just did duolingo but like you could you could use an app but okay yeah. but, and that sort of sets it off right away sort of that they they lean on her and then and then push her away at the same time mm -hmm. but i mean i think I, it's interesting seeing people's responses to the book because some people are like, oh, thank God my family is not like this. And some people are like, oh, there's definitely some relatable bits um, just amplified, which is kind of where I sit. 
And then some people are like, this was really upsetting for me because this is exactly what my family is like. And I think, oh God, that's oh, no. terrible. I'm very sorry. But you know, any, any group of people traveling together, um, there are going to be points where you, you get on each other's nerves and, and the, the parts of your personality that great kind of get amplified by being mm-hmm. stuck in a, in a house together, um, miles away from what you're used to and your sort of everyday comforts, um, and having to negotiate the, you know, what do we do today? How do we maximize everybody coming in with their own ideas of, what, what the perfect, you know, Florence yeah. holiday is. Um, I mean, and I'm kind of vicious with the characters, but um, in some, and, you know, I think that the assumption for a lot of people will be that I'm picking on my own family, but I'm really not. A lot of, uh, most of the Pace family has an exaggerated version of something that I do on vacation. So for example, Nicole coming in with her detailed itinerary, and expecting everything to revolve around her children because she's the one mother in the group. I have definitely been guilty of that before. And my family kind of mocked me for it. So I had to put it in the book. (laughs) It's putting it from the other perspective. Yeah. And I think that the fact that Anna has a sense of humor, I mean, you see where she's had to develop that with those kind of family dynamics. Yes. (laughs) But uh, makes it more makes it fun to be in her perspective when it's not a fun situation to be in but yeah like everything getting so amplified just with the the idea just with um the circumstances that come with traveling and when you accidentally pick a haunted airbnb Mm -hmm. yeah that makes it worse i would think (laughs) but there's always something you know travel we have this expectation of you know this you know instagram kind of travel the image of it you know the picture somebody takes and you just sort of you spool that out in your mind into this perfect two weeks or however long it is. But um, travel can be incredibly annoying. Um, and you just, you just kind of blur that part of your memory. Yeah. You, you know, the, the, the airport and the, the plane ride. I mean, I love, fl- I actually love flying, especially when I'm doing solo travel, but halfway through, you know, you're like, okay, I'm ready for this to be over. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, your luggage gets lost and, you don't speak the language and there's just this constant sort of discomfort of being foreign and, and this not being your usual circumstances. And if you have really high expectations for how you think this is supposed to go, it's almost worse because um, you have this cognitive dissonance of, I need a perfect holiday. You know, I've been really looking forward to this and, and it creates this inability to go with the flow that can be really, really stressful. Um, And I think it's like, and then, you know, depending on who you're with, travel can, you know, break up friendships. You, you know, you have a friend at home that you, you, you love each other, you get, you get along great. And then you, you go and on a trip together and, and you never want to speak to the person again, because you see different aspects of their personality come out, like how rude they are to the waiters, you know, how they criticize the, the culture to their face or, or even yeah. if it's not anything that damning, just that you just cannot decide, you cannot communicate um, or negotiate what to do with your trip. And it just gets, builds up tensions between you. Which leads nicely into my next question. What is it about vacations and horror that makes them a great pairing? It is that like kind of disorientation. I mean, you're out of, you're out of the usual, you're out of your comfort zone. You really, really want it to be great. Um, and, and the only thing you've really taken with you because you've left your house behind is yourself. And so you, and you, you start to see reflections of yourself in how different you are from the things around you. I mean, the, the, the more different the culture, the more kind of striking this probably is. And so you have to confront yourself in a certain way. Um, and the, you know, the, the feeling of being the other, Um, if you're not used to that can be really, really unsettling. And then also uh, travel is a circumstance in which lots of things are primed to go wrong because of the sort of logistics of it. Um, in exactly the circumstances where it's really hard to recover from the things going wrong because you don't speak the language or you don't understand Mm -hmm. the culture. You don't know what the road signs mean. Um, and so you, you, it's easy to spool that out into something, um, from lots of little things going wrong to something going very, very, very wrong. 
And yeah, as a tourist, you're not privy to the the local knowledge. Like when all the locals say, you know, we don't we don't go up to that place up on the hill. You as the outsider don't know why you're not. You don't and have it's this easy knowledge. To with that, yeah, yeah. Like, well, I will. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> do 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 do. I love traveling. I love traveling. It's like one of my favorite things in the world. Um, but I have nightmares almost weekly and have for years and years about traveling. And usually I'm in some either a city or a small town or a small village, Eastern Europe, somewhere kind of vaguely, I don't speak the language at all. Um, and I haven't booked accommodations and it's nighttime and the streets are desolate and I have to figure it out. And then sometimes it there's vampires. Sometimes there's just absolutely nobody in this town. Sometimes it's like, the, I don't know if you ever have those dreams where you're in a hotel and you go up the elevator and the floor's not finished. No. And you're just walking around a building site. It's <laughs> totally normal, right? I'll start <laughs> having these nightmares now, though. Yes, now sorry. that that's been introduced as a scenario. So I, like, I have the, I, it's obviously a preoccupation of mine. Like, travel as kind of a symbol of and I think it started when I when I got pregnant with my first child so I I have analyzed it and I think it has something to do with this feeling of not knowing where I'm going not knowing exactly what's going to happen next and feeling out of control with that so yeah yeah I think everybody has that feeling to some extent so travel as a theme um, amplifies all those feelings of being out of control. Yeah. And also, I mean, within horror, the, the types of places you're staying in, I feel like I've seen a, a new crop of horror that's like Airbnb rental. Yeah. Horror, but, we're like, yeah, it's somebody's space and you're yeah. invading it. And there's that question of like, why is somebody letting me live in their house? That's weird. And we've all just accepted that it's okay and it's nice and fine. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's not going to be. It is just odd. Um, we had to stay in an Airbnb for a week while we were waiting to move into our house because like the, the date that we like sold our house and the day we were moving in just like did not line up. <laughs> We stayed, yeah, in an Airbnb in Pittsburgh, and it was definitely someone's just, like, primary residence. You know, there was just, like, family pictures and, like, wedding pictures on the wall and just, like, a normal kitchen and, like, bedrooms. I'm just like, this just feels odd. Yeah, like, you, like you've, like, ha had amnesia. And waking up in a place like that is like, where am I? I'm just like, where are they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's also, it's a genre I really like in movies. It's in more movies, I feel like, than books. Yeah, I definitely think so. I know I saw the the rental with um shoot, how did I forget her name? She's married to David Franco. Allison Brie? Allison Brie. I'm like Annie. You, you know movie? Annie from Awesome. I did not know that. Yeah. I was gonna say Annie from Community. I'm like, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Um yeah. Like that Airbnb, you and your group of friends don't know this house, don't know if there's like cameras anywhere. You can't like get a hold of the person. Yeah, that, that freaked me out. And I'll go, I'll go places. Like I'll do like writing retreats at Airbnbs, and I'm like looking around for the camera. Like, like I'm qualified <laughs> find a hidden camera. Like I've have CIA training or something. But it freaked me out for sure. I start googling like, which is the like two way mirror one? Is it like if there's a space or if your fingers touch? Like I get all confused. I'm not gonna like unscrew the light bulbs. Or yeah, anything. I'm like I don't know who am I. But there was oh, I also think of. I mean, they're not my favorite type of movies, but the the hostel movies, especially the first one, is you know like annoying Americans abroad, and mm -hmm. see them pay a price for being essentially annoying Americans abroad. Yeah, I mean that that is the sort of positive. I mean, <laughs> positive. <laughs> okay, positive spin on it. My husband actually like hates those movies because he thinks of them as this American perspective of like never leave America. Or oh, it definitely, definitely is. Especially, well, and especially if you're a woman, this at least changes it to being young men that, you know, get led into being seduced into torture porn <laughs> instead of actual porn, which is what they'd hoped for. Yeah. Um, but like the Taken movies, you know, if you could sort oh of combine God. those, it's like, you're de you know, Eastern Europe, Europe, you're definitely going to get kidnapped by secret societies. Um, and he finds that offensive because he's British. I don't know. Yeah. 
I don't know. I despise the Taken movies. I don't know why. Like that is like a, a film franchise. I I despise. Well, I mean, that was the first <laughs> one, and then the second one was like, what again? <laughs> it's just I mean, that's just happening. carelessness. Come on. <laughs> At this point, you're on your own, dude. Yeah. Like, and he's like increasingly getting older and falling apart, and you just want to be like, put your feet up, man. You're you you burned this. Just stop. <laughs> Why does everyone keep getting taken? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it just... Taken again? There is, there is that fear, though, isn't there? Of, mm-hmm. like, you go outside your comfort zone and you're, you're just so wide-eyed and naive and excited to travel. And you're definitely, definitely going to be, like, taken advantage of and drugged and kidnapped and tortured. It's funny because it is the setup for, honestly, so much horror. Because even, like, Cabin in the Woods, it's like, yeah, you're there on vacation. You were there, like, on a trip with your friends, and you're yeah. being stalked from some like outside force, which is such a horror staple, and it's vacation horror. What's great? What's so great? I mean, there's so many great things about Cabin in the Woods. I really love that movie. But um, what's great about it is like you start off the movie, and you're like, "Wow, these idiots! Don't they know that they're driving into a horror movie? They're such cliches." But honestly, if somebody was like, "Oh, I've got, I'm going to rent this cabin." Um, it's like really nice. It's, it, you know, there's hikes. I'd be like, yeah, that sounds amazing. I would definitely go. Yeah. I would be the cliche. Your characters don't know the genre of movie they're in. Yeah. And yeah, they, they could have wandered into all sorts of circumstances given the ending of that movie. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's movie so good. I love that. Um, mm-hmm. And I love that the like, kind of refusal to be that cliche, to be like, no, I'm a human being and you can't reduce me to like the virgin ends the world (laughs) yeah you should have just gone with it i don't know if that's the takeaway that they should have died but it kind of was for me i don't know it does seem selfish to just like out of stubbornness like kill absolutely everyone i don't think they knew it was i think they didn't believe it yeah just gave away the ending sorry Um, everybody's seen this movie right we got then there's also another like americans traveling abroad you have midsummer I love that movie so much. I, I I watched that after I wrote my first horror loot. And I, I really it's, it's really and which is a which is a folk horror in a, like mm-hmm. an isolated British or European community, in this case it's British. Um and the similarity there is that you're sort of left with the feeling at the end that in some ways this is good. <laughs> That this community is actually good for the protagonist and you, you can understand why in the end she chooses it because it's actually really healing for her in a way that staying home would not have been um again i'm not sure if that's the right takeaway <laughs> but that was mine that like this is this was what she needed after the horrible things she'd been through um it was like cathartic she needed to be absolutely subsumed by another culture um yeah this is different from loot, by the way, <laughs> but um, yeah, but the, the, the horror of that, like, especially initially is this, um, you know, like, oh, what a, what a quaint little quirk of their culture. I'm going to go along for the ride because to speak up and be like, this is weird is incredibly rude. And you have yeah. that ingrained in yourself, like when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Don't be obnoxious. Yeah. Um, and but so they just like really ignore these gut feelings of this is wrong and we need to get out of here and this is weird especially since their friend brought them i mean that was really the way that yeah that it's like his it's the okay it's the check the check of safety yeah i mean the horror community is very divided on uh, interpretations of that film so you're definitely not alone on the the takeaways for that yeah and she just wasn't, I mean, she wasn't able, after what had happened to her, she wasn't able to to cope as an individual. I mean, she, that scene with the the sort of sisterhood around yeah. her screaming, um, how like healing that was for her. But of course, she's like, she sort of ceases to be a person at the end. Yeah. She's just another ant in that hive. And that that's scary in a certain way, but that's probably what she wanted and needed. She couldn't be herself anymore. She was not going to survive it. So that in that way, travel, she needed, she needed to travel from her horrible home circumstance in order to um, 
completely kind of detached from what her idea of what a life was and in order to survive in someplace else. And I guess that that's kind of the case with Diavola too. It, it's similar to Diavola in that um, she needed to travel someplace and have this sort of horrendous experience happen to her in order to redefine what a life is and cut ties with all the things that were toxic in her life. Um, but I think that's where the similarities probably end, but in a way, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a positive thing for them to go off face trauma and then come out the other side of it. Definitely. I can see those similarities. Oh, I also thought of, I still know what you did last summer. <laughs> I just love that fun era of slasher movies and there's so much about that movie that is just dumb <laughs> it's so dumb it's so dumb it's the a villain ending. reveal oh my gosh and it should have been i mean i know this has been much discussed but it should have been i still know what you did the summer before last at that point that's true but there was so, was so leaning so hard on like this sort of scream level of like twists and things without actually being clever. It was, the, it, but it is just delightful. It it's is delightful fun. in the same way as like five the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. <laughs> where if that movie had been any good, it wouldn't have been any good. But because it was so bad, it was amazing. That's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. But yeah, really? I, yeah. But the, I love the like horrible things are happening and continuing to happen but let's just go to the bahamas because we won something on the radio (laughs) yeah also a lesson that you should brush up on basic geography (laughs) yes (laughs) because yeah for listeners who have not watched the movie they well it's gonna spoil the movie (laughs) but yeah, they like win this trip by a, a radio station thing because they say that, God, what do they say the capital of Brazil is? But it's wrong. And now I'm trying, like, what is it? It's Rio. It's right? Brasilia. Oh, it's, so it's not Rio. So they probably said Rio. Yeah, they, I think they said Rio. Yeah. Well um, done. Good, good. Job. I've learned something. I to learned that <laughs> from that movie. <laughs> it's educational. But yeah, just that they get to this resort and it's like closed. It's like the off season. Like there's like so many red flags like immediately. And they're like, oh, totally fine. But then I'm sorry, that villain reveal kills me every time. So funny. It just was so tidy, wasn't it? Like, it's not a love triangle. Get back together with the guy from the first movie. Because I'm evil. Um, Oh, that movie reminded me of, like, do you remember this maybe me being old but um the like super specials like babysitters club would have these like chiller like double issues where they would go like on they would go someplace and for some reason they would all travel together which is really unrealistic like what parent would take the entire babysitters club on vacation but that's what it reminded me of it was like let's do this movie but like super special we'll take them on vacation somewhere i do remember those <laughs> And I was like, are they all getting just like, what is the budget for these parents to take like a whole group of babysitters plus their children, like plus their family? I know. Like, and worry about logistics and transportation. Yeah. And that's true. But then they would have these things happen to them. Like, like they'd be in a haunted hotel and then, and then they'd go home and it would be like, it never happened. They'd never talk about it again. It's very dreamlike. Yeah. Because they're a lot into the Babysitters Club right now. Um, and Amber, do you listen to the Babysitters Club Club podcast? No, no. They don't do Babysitters Club stuff anymore because they did all the books. Wow. Um, but it's essentially like two middle aged guys reading the the Babysitters Club books, and one of them had a nostalgia for it. Like you know, went to like his cousin's house and would read them off her shelf, and so. He's like walking his friend through it. But, you know, you get to a certain point where like these girls never age. They're like perpetually seventh grade. Um, And, you know, they found interviews with Anna Martin talking about how she essentially wanted to trap these girls in Amber, I believe was her wording. And so they like talked about it like a horror thing. And they have all these like weird spinoff, like cosmic horror theories about the Babysitter's Club universe. 
Whoa. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. Like this sort of Truman Show aspect of sort of like being trapped and observed. But like, what if they stuck, they made Truman stay at age 11 or whatever? Yeah. And if their minds progressed past that, but their bodies didn't, that would be very troubling. That would be. That's cool. I like that. It's funny. I did. I, I wonder if it was because of the super specials, but I did go straight from Big Sitters Club to Christopher Pike. There was nothing in between. Um, well, there was like, I, re- I read a lot of like true ghost stories. I was pretty obsessed with ghosts as a kid, which will surprise no one now that I am a horror author. Um, but yeah, it, it, it seemed to track like Babysitter's Club because of the super specials. I could now read yeah. things about like slashers, tormenting teenagers. I mean, it seems like a, a good pipeline. Yeah. Well, should we talk about some books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My first pick is probably the expected pick. But yes, I am talking about The Ruins by Scott Smith, because I just feel like if you talk about vacation horror, you talk about Americans abroad. I just feel like The Ruins is what people are going to think of when it comes to like proper horror properties. Mm hmm. So this is about two young couples who are on a lazy Mexican vacation and they make friends with fellow tourists and the brother of one of those tourists disappears and he essentially recruits them all on this trip to go to these ruins where his brother was last seen as they are like making their way there you know their their driver doesn't want to go there and is telling them like nope you should definitely not go over there but you know they're like we'll pay you more okay fine we'll take you there and they go there and they find that they are immediately stranded on these on these ruins and they are essentially like not allowed to leave and this group immediately starts turning against each other you know they figure out essentially what happened to the people that were there before things escalate tensions rise with the people and it is it is bloody and psychological you've done a really good job of describing that book without spoilers so i will <laughs> try to as well because it's hard it is hard but I went into that book like blank so I think it is good to recommend the book that way because yeah what the horror is is very interesting um but yeah I mean this is another scenario in in a in a book where I can sort of see myself in it that I would be the person that was like I don't want to just stay on a beach all day I want to go and see ancient ruins and go for a hike and see nature and I would feel really kind of good about myself in doing that like I was not being an ugly American I was actually going out and experiencing the culture in some way that is in morally or intellectually better than the people around me who were just <laughs> getting drunk by the pool but okay. that it's I guess the real the real first sin and there's a lot of sins in this book and ways that people are horrible to each other and make crucial mistakes but the first one is is not listening to the the warning signs if somebody from the area says you need to not do this you need to not go there you listen you don't go oh yeah but you know what like ruins are really cool and i want to see it and i can justify that because this guy's looking for his brother yeah but i could see myself doing that honestly (laughs) it's funny because i have always identified with the Jenna Malone character. Of course, now I'm forgetting her name in the book. But oh, the one that the movie is it good? It's pretty good. It's different from the book, um, mm-hmm. which is a. I didn't know Jenna Malone was in it. I love her. Yeah, uh, which is a little bit of a gripe I have because in the book her character I think is a little more competent, and they give a lot of her positive traits to her boyfriend Jeff, who's like the leader of the group, and so they just kind of make her out to be this like drag on the group and you just make just makes her like a very hateable character everyone in them everyone in the story is like a hateable character to some extent there is no hateable. like <laughs> there is no hero ever especially like when you know day whatever things start getting worse and the psychological horror of it ramps up and they like really start turning on each other you know like no one is coming out good they're, yeah they're easily manipulated i mean it is it is this kind of like couples vacation again like turned up to 11 by circumstances 
like all this stuff was going on in the background anyway. You know, it was this is how they felt about each other privately and yeah. little microaggressions. But um, yeah, it's this is a hard book to talk about. I'm just <laughs> I'm just gonna say that what the circumstances uh, conspire to bring all that sort of inner life outward and um yeah it's a very um it's a very depressing book <laughs> it's very kind of bleak um it is, in the yeah. sense that it's just going to keep happening too is um it's hard to not sort of take away from that that the author just thinks maybe humanity is just kind of a lost cause well the ending to the movie is different Oh, really? But I don't, I'm like, that's still bleak in a way. Yeah, but the book keeps it kind of personal that it isn't, you don't have to think about the, the, the circuit, you know, the greater implications of things. It's like, well, th these people just kind of, they were going to tear into each other at, at some point anyway. Yeah. And this, this circumstance yeah. just really helped uh, bring all issues to the surface. It was like therapy, really, like really intense couples therapy. It just does remind me of that second season of White Lotus, actually, the, those two couples. And have you seen that show? That's I watched the first season. I didn't watch the sec. I didn't watch the second season. That's in Italy. It's quite oh, good. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. I did hear that it was good. Okay, I would put the ruins in the freezer. There are scenes of body horror described in this book that still haunt me to this day. Stuff from the circumstances, but then also. Like Jeff is a med student and he has to do like this very primitive, like surgical, like medical stuff and amputation. Like it is just like rough. Like these people have it rough up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's upsetting for sure. And I think the bleakness adds to it. There's not a lot of kind of comic relief moments to diffuse it, um, which is something that I have to do in my book so that I can get through writing them. <laughs> so I admire that sort of bleakness. Um even though I sort of kind of, it makes me like a book less, honestly. If it's when bleak. There's, when there's the the dark ending. Because um, I, I just, there's some part of me that needs a little like pat on the back at the end of something, even horror. <laughs> yeah, I kind of get that. I don't think I tend to gravitate towards like really bleak endings. But it's like, I look back and I'm like, I get why it was done, but it's not my favorite for sure. Sometimes it's great though. Sometimes yeah. the bad I'm ending like, is the most satisfying. Like Drag Me to Hell, I always cite as like at the end of that movie. I mean, the movie's called Drag Me to Hell. If it hadn't had a sad ending, you'd be disappointed. That's true. So that is The Ruins by Scott Smith. All right, I got one and it goes with this one, actually. Um, I'm going to recommend The Ritual by Adam Neville which is about um, a bunch of, I'm going to say young middle-aged, like they're like 34. Um, they were college roommates, um, four guys from England um, who've kind of drifted apart and they're taking a reunion trip to, to, to bond again. Um, and they've gone hiking in Sweden. Again, something that I would totally sign up for. Um, but two of them are not really prepared for the hike and are already injured. So the very capable kind of leader of the group, the glue um, who keeps them, their friendships going really decides that they should just take a quick detour through these woods so that they can cut off the hike and get to where they're going sooner, which is the fatal mistake because these woods are every kind of wrong. Um, I still, I'm still not sure if it is like a parallel dimension, like kind of pocket universe thing, but there's a, there's a monster in there and it just goes really badly. And the tensions between them come to a boil. Um, and they, they get really lost, which I found, I find that really scary. Yeah. So you get the survival horror aspect of it. I mean, it's really visceral, the descriptions of their like just starting from their wet clothes and the, the injuries and having to sort of keep hobbling through despite, um, you know, a twisted knee or, or like a sort of a, a rash from the, the wetness. And the, it's just raining solidly the whole time they're there. And they come across this cabin. 
So, of course, they go in. They want to get out of the rain. They want to light the thing. And uh, the cabin is the... F- I think it's that's actually the second big red flag. The first is that they find this, like, moose hanging from a branch. Like, laid out nicely, but gutted. And they're like, whoa, that's weird. I didn't know a bear could, you know, put a moose in a tree. And that's how they justify it to themselves, because that's what you would do. Yeah. And it just gets more and more horrible for them as it goes on. Um, so the first half is kind of this survival aspect with lots of weird stuff in this in the woods. And then about, at about the halfway mark, it turks, takes an even stranger turn. Um, and they encounter some local Swedish people. Now, I don't know. I don't know anything about Sweden. So I can't say that this is like an authentic depiction of Swedish culture. And I would hope that it is not. Um, but it, it it definitely gets into the more sort of, whereas the first half is it, they could be in any wilderness, really European kind of specifically from some of the sacrificial sort of signs that they find. Um, but the second half is very much, oh yeah, they are in Sweden. Um, it's, it's an interesting book. I, it's almost two books. And so in terms of the fear factor, I, don't really get scared by books that much but the first half of the book was really scary um and then the second half was so strange that it to me was less scary so i think it averages out to fridge but the there were moments in the first half that were very they were very moving like it deals with this friendship group and their injuries and losing each other and the danger that they're in really humanely. And I, w- I found it really moving actually. Um, and then the second half is somebody having to really grapple with the mistakes that they've made over their lives. And um, yeah, like there's a death metal band. There's these like kids from a death metal band <laughs> that show up. It's very bonkers. <laughs> I saw the movie. I did really like the movie. Mm-hmm. So is it fairly close is I, I think I think that sort of the the beats were in different places in the movie versus the book. Um, I can't really remember. Is it at like the halfway mark that he gets sort of tended to by the old woman? I think so. Are they going on the trip to like in remembrance of their friend that died? Yes, but you don't okay. find that out in the book until like way later. Okay. And it's not yeah, that's it's like not right at the beginning the of the it's movie. Much more, it's much more like. Um, we're we're middle-aged and we're going through divorces and everything kind of sucks and um we need to hang out again and try to remember how to be friends and they're not good at it yeah but it's interesting it speaks to you know that this particular um difficulty that middle-aged men have i don't know if it's just british men or it's universal of, of like maintaining friendships from their youth yeah and making new friends even you know whereas i think women find it easier to to keep those relationships going, men really struggle with it. And that becomes the, the tension of the group is the, you know, we used to be close and now we're not. That's interesting. There's usually like a sort of relationship tension point or boiling point in these, aren't there? Mm-hmm. Like the ruins, yeah. it's the, the dysfunctional romantic relationships. And in this case, it's a sort of dysfunctional friend group. The Ritual by Adam Neville need to pick that up i really enjoyed the movie that's been on my tbr for like ever <laughs> it's it's really um yeah it's interesting it's it's the depictions of of the sort of perils of nature and the discomforts of the survival mm-hmm. elements of it are really visceral and affecting speaking of more like relationship stuff my next pick is candy cane kills by brian mccauley and it's funny because most of these vacation stories are like summer stories like summer vacation and this is like no for christmas we're renting an airbnb it's like winter winter vacation so this is about austin um whose parents are on the brink of divorce and this is like their last attempt of like doing something for the families like we're gonna you know, we're in LA, we're going to rent a cabin up in Big Bear for for Christmas and just have like, you know, a really magical Christmas in this like snowy town. But what they don't know is that there is bloody history behind that cabin, of course. <laughs> and 
um, yeah, when things just start going wrong and it is interesting to see the relationships and how they 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 got strengthened honestly through this like having to work together oh, against good. this like common enemy um and common evil and this was just such a fun book like it was like a fun like christmas slasher novella so can't like candy cane is the go- is the the killer or yeah candy cane like c a i n and that's really her name yeah candy cane i don't know this book <laughs> already that is hilarious and there's going to be a sequel which i'm excited about as you know in slasher nature you have to have this franchise yeah absolutely yeah, and this is through Shockwave Books and kind of like their aesthetic is like old VHS yeah, totally. type thing. So it's just in that genre. It's a lot of fun. Even that setup of the like the parents are going to get a divorce and like how much that affects the kids. Like that's such an 80s kind of yeah. horror movie setup. I'm like, oh, family's going to be torn apart. And now we're going to be torn apart by knives. Yep. <laughs> that should have been the... The tagline. Oh, yeah, that should well, have been the tagline. <laughs> always do a mock-up poster. There you go. I would put this in. This is between room temperature and fridge. I will say, like, there was some pretty like gruesome kills, but the tone of this overall is kind of fun. Yeah, I like that. I think there's room in my heart for like deep in- introspective horror that really speaks to the human condition and is the kind of horror where, you know, it's really about something else. Um, yeah. And, but, but then there's room in my heart, a lot of room in my heart for things that just deliver on the premise. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That are like snakes, like what snakes on a plane should have been <laughs> like the trailer for snakes on a plane, like as a, as a book, you know, that, that, it 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 it's, it just does what it says on the box and it just delivers um the promise of the premise um so i've got a recommendation along those lines which i really really like it's called adrift by krr griffiths um and so this is vampires on a cruise ship it's i love great. that great and it doesn't it's it's the way it's written is very much like one of those kind of british terrorist thrillers where you're like you get the the terrorist perspective and you get the beat cop and you get you know the world weary i mean i'm this is this is not what you get on in this book i'm just giving an analogy so in this you get the the people that are in league with the vampires and then you get the the head of security who was ex military and you get the the poor guy that has agoraphobia and is on honeymoon with his wife. And this is like really brave thing for him to do because he has severe PTSD from a random attack um, robbery. And but he's 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 done it for his wife who he adores, and they're going on the biggest cruise ship in the world on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic, and like man, he doesn't even get to enjoy the ship. It's hours in, an AMP goes off, and um, the ship is just plunged into darkness. Because if you think about a, a cruise ship, you think of it being, as being well lit. Um, but if all the lights are off, there's so many interior corridors and things, and they're in complete darkness on this massive ship. And then a big crate full of vampires is dropped into the middle of it. And now these a are crate? not a, like a huge shipping container and it crushes <laughs> people when it falls. I'm um, obsessed with this. Sorry, keep going. It's so good. It's so, I mean, you know, some books, when the monster comes, you're like, oh God, oh no, oh no, the monster's coming. And in this, you're like, the monsters are coming. <laughs> this is awesome. They're going to kill everybody. It's just. So, I mean, and I feel bad because there are these really affecting moments of like people dying horribly. Um, so I have to, you know, take account of the fact that I was so gleefully reading it, but it is just fun. So for example, you have like this scene of absolute carnage, you know, told very viscerally in a very, very frightening way. 
And then it cuts to another POV immediately. And it's this guy going, vampires? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and it's great because it like cuts the tension. I mean, all the sort of beats are there of, of just a really, really fun read. And I also appreciate the, as much as I love the kind of analogy of, of vampires as the rich, the elite that are sort of elegant and seductive and sucky dry. Um, I don't find that scary. And these are, but these are like primordial inhuman beasts that will just rip out the organ in you that will keep you alive and suffering and then watch, you know, they're like really scary. Um, so I found, and the, the element of being in the total dark in an enclosed space where there's all kinds of hazards, you know, like yeah. in a cruise ship and it's fun. It's like, we might fall in the, the indoor pool cause you don't see it or you might fall down the steps and get a concussion and then there's the monster. It's just a really, really fun book. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the, um, I did want to also shout out white out by Gabriel Dillon, who's a friend of mine. He wrote a YA, another YA, um, vacation book where they're on a, in a ski resort that gets overrun with vampires. And again, it's like not the elegant <laughs> and rice vampires. They are um, really, really scary. Um, they're like cave dwellers most of the time. So that that's the kind of vampires I like. Um, but yeah, so this is Adrift by K.R. Griffiths, by far my favorite um, cruise ship horror I've ever read. Um, <laughs> I'm going to call, I'm going to say it's a, it's a fridge just because it's so much fun. You know, like it, there are bit, bits of it that are really scary. Like you get your heart racing, but it's just so enjoyable that you don't really get fully scared. Although, I mean, nothing scares me. So <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I loved it. My final pick is Narcissus by Adam Godfrey. This is a novella and it is following a group of Americans vacationing in Greece, and they set out to find a subterranean pool that's rumored to be the one by which the demigod Narcissus once wasted away in self-obsession. And what started out as a fun excursion quickly escalates to a full-blown nightmare, because after they look in the pool, they come to find that their own reflections are infected by an ancient evil. After looking in this pool anytime they catch their own reflection like something is off about it and it it gets this curse that they now all have where they have to avoid their reflection because their reflection is off and it will like drive them insane and there's also something like coming after them via their reflection oh i love that that's scary that's a scary it idea it is really scary and it's so inventive and that you know they're like oh I, I simply just won't look in mirrors like i will cover up the mirrors but like your reflection is in a lot more than just any mirrors. reflective surface yeah like a shiny table yeah it's very much like smile like if you watch yeah. the horror movie smile it's like yeah they they all have this thing that's like coming for them and you're also following this cop who's like coming across these like very awful bodies because the kills in this also like do not hold back like they're like Mm. awful kills and you also see like what they see but like what they see is being manipulated by this like curse wow as they're dying that's very good and very good for a novella where like it's all like sustained in a very short amount of pages are they warned like are when they're in greece are people like don't go there yeah like when they go in they're like oh you know they say that these waters like looking in there will drive you crazy or something like not, that. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that tie to, to Greek mythology too. And I love the sort of like, I don't know, there's a certain consumerist aspect to tourism of, of like, I, I get to do whatever I want. I'm going to see all the sites and like check off my bucket list. And it's like in doing that, that you have, committed a, a crime of not taking the culture seriously enough or the mythology yeah. seriously enough and that's sort of the initial sin yeah they also like find a a survivor like another person who like had the curse and is like living so it's kind of like final destination two where like they find clear and she's like survived the first movie but she's like not living her fullest life you know because she is like haunted by this curse 
it has a little bit of that as well yeah is it like in the first batman movie where like everyone starts to look really bad because they can't use makeup (laughs) they always have something in their teeth that's yeah that sounds great i'm gonna check that one out yeah i had a lot of fun with it i would put this yeah this is like between I would put this in the fridge. There was some really good like inventive kills that I was not expecting. Like, and it's got that, like something's always lurking. I like creepy Greek mythology. That's fun. That's Uh, different from like, you know, Circe and (laughs) all the, in the Greek mythology retellings. I like that this one is actually just like a serial killer. Yeah. It's like a slasher curse. Well, I actually have a weird connection, but my last recommendation um, has another kind of sort of evil Greek mythology aspect to it. Ooh. Um, so this is a collection of short stories. It's Don't Look Now and Other Stories is the, um, there's a lot of different compilations of Daphne du Maurier short stories, but this is, this is a particularly good one. Um, so Don't Look Now, I think a lot of people know, and I will talk about that, but, um, the one that, that has the Greek mythology connection is called, um, Not, not after midnight and it's this very british school teacher who's been sort of sent sent off on sabbatical to to sort of do research in in greece so he's gone off to this greek resort and he meets this really weird american couple that are kind of obnoxious and loud um and it winds up being um a, a sort of ambiguous as to whether he is actually cursed or whether he's just using that as an excuse for his own um, alcoholism um, by this like statue of Bacchus that they leave for him. Um, But it's so creepy and sort of creeping this sense of this leering object and this way his peace of mind is just infiltrated by it. Um, It's very much psychological horror as most of Daphne du Maurier is, but um, that's a good one in the collection. So that's, you know, somebody traveling to, I mean, they're all very, very British. They're all very Brits abroad, which is like the British equivalent of of ugly Americans. Um, But I don't look now, which everybody knows from the movie, mostly because of like, everybody knows the ending. Everybody knows like this, the sex scene with Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie. It was like so realistic. They thought it was actually porn. Um, the short story is different. <laughs> it's <laughs> extremely British in the way that most of it deals with um, this man who he went on vacation in Venice with his wife. Um, they're they're mourning the, the death of their child, but that's kind of incidental. And um, she has to go. There's an emergency at home and she has to go. But this is before the time of like being able to connect via cell phone or email or anything. So he gets this sort of sense that something has gone really wrong with her that she has not made it home that something horrible has happened to her and he he goes to the police he goes everywhere and it's just like the series of kind of missed connections and misunderstandings and then the ending which i am going to give away because i think everybody knows it he he follows this sort of red coat that reminds him of his child um and it turns out to be this serial killer that's kind of mentioned throughout the story that's that's a little person is a dwarf and but what's so funny about it is in the end he's like he's like oh you know figures <laughs> he's not in the movie it's really really scary and in the in the story he's like well yeah this would happen to me wouldn't it like <laughs> like all right well serves me right kind of <laughs> and he sort of dies thinking like well I'm an idiot um and I just loved that it was so British you know <laughs> like sod's law <laughs> oh well. Don't have to go to the police anymore. And then this other, the other short story that was has to do with travel and that is called The Way of the Cross. And it's about this guy going on like a church trip to Jerusalem. And it's really important to him to see all these religious sites. And it's, there's so much dread in this story and so much tension. And he has so many resentments towards his fellow travelers. And he just judges them all so harshly for not appreciating the place in the right way. And you kind of think it's heading in the direction of like Midnight Mass feels like something horrible is going to happen to this man that it's just that it's just cascading into to a horrible thing happening to him and a horrible thing does happen to him but it is not at 
all what you expect. Daphne du Maurier is the master of introducing what you think is the threat and then it's something else completely. And every one of the stories in this has that element of it, of, of um, you think that this is the horror? Well, it's something else. Um, and I, I won't spoil that one, but it's it's quite poignant and fitting for this character. And um, I would not say that these, these are really much more psychological horror. I would say it's room temperature, but they stay with you for a long time. I, I, I think about those stories a lot. Um, and the, in, the travel aspect is well um, explored from different angles. She was clearly preoccupied with British people going to places where they didn't belong and what could go wrong <laughs> under those circumstances. <laughs> I'll have to check this out. I actually just bought it on the Kindle store the other day because it was on sale. So oh, I'll have nice. to check it out. Yeah. I don't know which, what my table of contents is because you said they're all like pretty different. Yeah, it should. Sometimes the, if it's the one with the birds, it's a different one. It's Stone Look Now, Not After Midnight, Borderline Case, Way of the Cross, and The Breakthrough. Borderline case is the one where she goes to Ireland because she realized her dad had this connection to IRA terrorists and she like wants to write an article about them. And that's another one where, yeah, something awful is going to happen and it's not what you think. <laughs> it's like okay. all of these are. The, <laughs> and, and funnily enough, the, the, the breakthrough one seems like it's going to be really, really horrific and it's actually kind of sweet and thoughtful and introspective. Oh. You've made me excited to check this out. I love her. I mean, she's like yeah. my sort of hallmark. Well, a tradition we have on this podcast is to ask our guests for a chilling obsession or something that they've been enjoying in horror lately. All right. Mine is another book and I got to blurb it and I'm really excited about it. It comes out this fall. It's called The Black Hunger by Nicholas Pullen. And it is just the most genre defying book. And those are my favorite kinds of books. But this is like a historical adventure. It's one of these books that has like a story within a story within a story because there's they, there's a, you know, a, a journal that's found and then a letter that's read within it. So it's like a puzzle box. Um, and it's just so bonkers. It's about Buddhist cannibal cults that are trying to bring about the end of the world. Um, and I don't want to give too much away about it because it is just the most delightfully terrifying and romantic and, and sweeping book. I mean, it takes you all across the globe um, and into Oxford. And uh, I think it's set in like, oh gosh, is it? I think it's pre-World War I. But there's like, you know, spy agencies. There's just everything you I would want in a book is in this book. And the monsters are really, really scary. And the baddies are really scary. Um, and the cannibalism is icky, but not to the extent that you're like, I have to put this away. Um, and it's the first in a series, which I'm very excited about. And I, I'm going to be obnoxious to this poor writer <laughs> because I blur because he asked me to blurb it, which was very kind of him. I'm going to be like, I need to see the sequel as soon as you've written it. <laughs> I about this book. I mean, that's high praise. That sounds really interesting. It's just like delicious. It's like a candy box of horror. You know, it's got like everything it, without it, 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 it holds together, but it has all these elements of like fun horror, you know, sort of like Russian count, like in a remote estate that mistreats his servants. And yeah. And to have like Buddhists be the baddies is really interesting. <laughs> but yeah, it, I don't think it, I've come across that before. Yeah, it's great. What was that title again? The Black Hunger. Okay. by Nicholas Pullen. And I think it comes out in September. Okay. I'll have to keep my eye out for that. Well, the second tradition we have on this podcast is to ask our guests for a final girl song. So what is your song? So I think a lot of songs would be kind of like sort of defiant, but defeated and like sort of gritty. And mine is not that. <laughs> My final girl song would be Mr. Blue Sky um, by Electric Light Orchestra, <laughs> which is the most like defiantly, almost like aggressively, angrily cheerful song I have ever heard. Um, it's so relentlessly like, fuck you, happy. 
Um, that that would be it. It would be, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not only going to walk out of this scenario um, alive, but fuck you. I am happy and I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be like a Disney freaking princess the rest of my life just to, to in defiance. And I guess that's what the song's about. It's like, and, and if you've ever lived in England, you know that like we get really angry at the gray sky around this time of year. And when the sun comes out, we're like, yeah, screw you, English weather. Like, and that's why this song is so kind of angrily happy. Um, and that's what I would be. I'd be like, no, I'm going to thrive now. I am wa- I'm walking away and I'm just going to be so happy for the rest of my life. And I hate you. That would be my final <laughs> song. I love that. I'm loving this energy. <laughs> angrily upbeat. Yeah. And that's kind of my personality, actually. Like upbeat out of spite. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on here and talking with me today about Diavola and vacation horror. Thank you. This is so fun. Where can people find you online? I have a website (laughs) that I do update from time to time. uh, Jenniferthorne.com. I am on Instagram as I think it's Jen Marie Thorne. Um, I'm on TikTok every once in a while when I can be bothered and I'm on threads and I think that about wraps it up. Yeah. Instagram's probably the best way to find me. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on TikTok, threads, and Instagram at Books in the Freezer, or you can send us an email at booksinthefreezer at gmail.com. Show notes for this episode and all previous episodes are at booksinthefreezer.com, where you will find a list of the books mentioned, as well as several different ways you can support the podcast, including links to the Patreon, links to merch, and affiliate links. So again, that is booksinthefreezer.com. And it is not too late to participate in this year's reading challenge. You can find that on Instagram under hashtag BITF reading challenge 24. You can also find links on the show notes, which I believe take you to the official reading challenge on StoryGraph. And if you're a StoryGraph user, you can use it as a reading challenge and mark off books as you go and, you know, specify what prompt you would like to use this book for. It's a lot of fun. It's a great platform. I have been your host, Stephanie Ganya, and thank you so much for listening. See you next time on Books in the Freezer. (laughs) 